seven, video number five, uh, where we talk about vaporization. And the vaporization reaction is taking H2O liquid, that's an L, uh, going to H2O gas, and delta H of vaporization, which is the change in the heat energy or the change in the enthalpy of vaporization, we'll abbreviate it as delta H vape. Could have written it as delta H RXN like we've done in similar times for any reaction, but since this is a specific reaction that we want to remember, it is a vaporization reaction going from liquid to gas phase. And then the number here, 40.7 kilojoules per mole at T equals 100 degrees Celsius. Um, this is a number we'll use uh, throughout the rest of the lecture outline. This is the opposite, uh, or the opposite of this process is condensation. And we know from prior lectures that H2O, uh, when we switch the reactants and products, so we have H2O gas going to H2O liquid, that simply changes the sign of the delta H. So for this reaction, which we could also call delta H condensation, but we don't use it nearly as much as vaporization. So we'll just leave it as delta H reaction equals minus delta H vaporization and minus 40.7 kilojoules per mole. So as you take H2O liquid and turn it into H2O gas, it requires energy. This is an endothermic process. It will always take energy to turn liquid into gas. And when you turn a gas back into a liquid, you can recover that same amount of energy. And uh, let's think about gas versus liquid phase. We've previously said when we studied gases that the whole point of a gas, or one of the, the, the ma main important aspects of it, is that intermolecular forces are negligible. And that's true for all ideal gases. Well, let's say it's true for all gases at room uh, temperature and pressure. And we said the definition of an ideal gas is one for which the intermolecular forces, which are the forces of attraction, are truly zero. Uh, but we also said that if you take gas particles and you think of them as having 10 diameters between them, that's why intermolecular forces are negligible. They're far enough apart that the forces of attraction are negligible uh, or close to zero. Well, that's a very different case for H2O liquid. For H2O liquid, we said that the uh, spacing of the particles is essentially the same spacing for solids, except that the uh, particles can move around. And so intermolecular forces are very important for liquids. And the reason that we study vaporization, or in fact, a special case of vaporization is called boiling. The reason that the boiling point is so related to intermolecular forces and the strength of IMFs is because you're going from a state where IMF are very important to a state where IMF are negligible. So perhaps it makes sense that as the strength of the intermolecular forces change, it would have an effect on boiling and vaporization in general. All right, so um, for the Bolt, so let's go back to for gases, the Boltzmann distribution of kinetic energies. And we've had fraction of molecules versus kinetic energy. And we've seen this before, we have lower temperature and higher temperature. And if we think of the minimum kinetic energy needed to escape to the gas phase at higher temperature, they're moving faster, they have uh, more kinetic energy, and more of them can escape into the gas phase. So uh, for, um, at least for delta H, so uh, stronger IMF leads to larger delta H of vaporization. And delta H vaporization is one of the properties we started talking about as being proportional to uh, intermolecular forces. 
Now we're going to take a step farther in our study of um, uh, vaporization and talk about something called dynamic equilibrium. Dynamic equilibrium, uh, the first thing we need to know is that uh, when a reaction can go both forwards and backwards, it will establish equilibrium with some amount of reactants and some amount of products. It will establish equilibrium with some amount of reactants and some amount of products. Um, and our example is going to be our vaporization reaction, except now we're going to put double arrows here, okay? Because instead of thinking it either as vaporization, flip reactants and products, now it's condensation, we're going to think of them as both being able to occur at this uh, um at the same time. And I've drawn it as two full arrows, but oftentimes you'll see it drawn for equilibrium arrows with just single head arrows here, uh, more like the electrons. Um, let's see, there we go. Okay, and um, the exact amounts of liquid and gas, H2O, depends upon pressure and temperature. P and T. And as an example of that, what I might suggest to you is that if the temperature was 25 degrees Celsius, then uh, most H2O will be water. Although a little will be H2O gas, and we know this because the vapor pressure of H2O at 25 degrees Celsius is 23.78. So this is the vapor pressure table we've used before. 23.78 millimeters of mercury. So, but most of it will be water. And then if we go to T equals 125 degrees Celsius, that's above the boiling point most of the H2O, if not all of it, so almost all, will be H2O gas. And so this is one illustration that temperature matters. If we take uh, water vapor at 125 degrees Celsius and then cool it down, we can make H2O liquid. And that's evidence that this reaction can go both ways. And this is the first time we've seen this in uh, this class. However, in future chemistry classes, you'll see a lot of this type of thing. But um, equilibrium tends to refer to the fact that there will establish some amount and then uh, they'll, it'll uh, look like the reaction stops. The dynamic nature is two parts. One is when you change conditions, the reaction does respond. The other part is that even after you get to equilibrium, the reactions are both occurring just at the same rate. And we don't want to say too much about that. We just want to know for now that reactions can go forwards and backwards. And specifically, this one. <laughs> All right. And so, um, now we've talked about what vapor pressure is before, but I wanted to go over it again. And 
first thing is you need a closed container to observe the vapor pressure. And so what you can think of is that we are uh, in here, we have our collecting a gas over water because this is stoppered. And so initially um, there will be almost no H2O gas. And so the H2O, the forward reaction, H2O liquid going to H2O gas. occurs. Okay? If there is no gas up here, there can be no reverse reaction in this case. Okay, and then at some point you get some of them and then uh, the forward reaction and the reverse reaction are both happening. but not at equilibrium. Okay. And then at some point, you will, uh, the amount of H2O gas stops changing. the amount of H2O liquid stops changing. And then that when that occurs, that is at equilibrium. So it has the word or root of equal in it. What is equal? or what is uh, equilibrated is that there, things have stopped changing. Okay? But even though things have stopped changing, some of the liquid is becoming gas, some of the gas is becoming liquid, that's what these little blue arrows uh, uh, refer to. It's just that the liquid that's becoming gas and the gas that's becoming liquid is occurring at the same rate. That is the dynamic part. Uh, so rates of forward and reverse reactions are the same. Are equal. And so we get to the point where H2O liquid is at equilibrium for H2O gas. And then one other thing we can say about this, when this is true, the partial pressure of H2O equals the vapor pressure. Okay? And so this is our equilibrium picture. Yes. Okay. Now, the boiling point is the temperature which the vapor pressure is the same as the atmospheric pressure. And we can look at our table, I think. Somewhere in here, yes, there we go. If we look at our table of values here, you can see that at 100 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure of 760 millimeters of mercury, which is one atmosphere. And so now let's do a little thought experiment. Let's think about if we have a, a stoppered uh, Erlenmeyer flask or just any flask with some H2O liquid in it and it's at T equals 25 degrees Celsius. What will happen is that the H2O liquid will evaporate until we get to equilibrium and the partial pressure of H2O will equal 22.78 millimeters of mercury. 
And then, all right, then let's just talk about what we're doing here. H2O liquid, add uh, equilibrium reaction with H2O gas. So then we increase temperature, which increases kinetic energy. And that's going to, when you increase the kinetic energy, that's going to uh, make more gas. So this reaction is shifting some of the liquid into gas. Okay, and let's say we go to, I'm going to try and draw the same Erwin Meyer flask. That was terrible. But now, let's suppose we're now at 75 degrees Celsius. Okay, we still have H2O liquid. We do have a little less. And now the partial pressure of H2O at 75 degrees is 289.1 millimeters of mercury. Okay. So, and higher vapor pressure, higher temperature, more gas, more kinetic energy. Okay. And then from there, we decrease temperature. We decrease kinetic energy, and again, I'll try and draw the same one. Now we're down to 50 degrees C. Now we still have the H2O liquid, but now since we've decreased the kinetic energy, the H2O gas uh, or the on average everything has less energy so some of the gas uh, so we're going to make less gas which means that according to this reaction oops there we go um, so shift some gas to liquid and that's called do the reverse reaction so, uh, and what we're trying to attempt to show, what I'm trying to attempt to describe in pictures is that depending upon the temperature, we can be at equilibrium, we can increase temperature, we can make more gas, we can decrease temperature, we can make more liquid, and the vapor pressure here at 50 degrees Celsius is going to be 92.6. millimeters of mercury. This reaction goes both ways and the reaction responds uh, with by changing the amount of liquid and gas by doing the forward and reverse reaction. Okay? And so we could also have gone straight to 50 degrees and gotten the same 92.6. Remember pressure and temperature are what we call state functions, meaning that it doesn't matter how you get from one point to the other, the variables will still be the same. Okay. Now, um, if we had instead gone down here, and double the volume, by adding a second uh, flask up top here. When you double the volume, you're going to half the pressure. So at first, um, the pressure will be lower, but to get to equilibrium, this reaction will then evaporate more H2O or sorry, vaporize, evaporate, vaporize. Uh, I've been using vaporize, two words for the same thing. Vaporize more, H2O liquid, 
to H2O gas until P of H2O equals 23.78 millimeters of mercury. <clears throat> so you can change the temperature, you can change the pressure, the reaction responds to get back to an equilibrium, and there is an equilibrium pressure called the vapor pressure. That seems like a good place to stop.